Okay, we're going to get started today. And as we do that, I realize I have the wrong day on here. This would be Try Hard Tuesday, not Work Habit Wednesday. I'm, I'm working so hard on this course, I can't remember what day of the week it is. But anyway, this week's uh, sort of regular sort of study habit reminder is going to be an introduction from Dr. Heidel, who will talk to you about a program called Chem Gym, which is a way for all of you to get extra practice, extra help in this class. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Heidel briefly for her to introduce that. Okay. Hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try without the microphone because I always like um, make it spit and make weird sounds. So thank you for having me. It's nice to be here with you guys. I just want to tell you briefly about a program in our office called Chem Gym. So where I work is called Launch. We're the Learning and Tutoring Center on campus. And we have individual tutoring in a lot of different classes. Um, mostly we have math and science classes. So for you guys, uh, we have a lot of classes. And But a few years ago, we started this program called Chem Gym, where the tutors meet with students for three hours a week to do extra practice problems. Because as you know, this course can be difficult, and doing practice problems uh, can, can help you. So, the one for 1311, it meets on Mondays and Wednesdays from 12 to 1.30. Uh, it's in our office, which is in Cougar Village 1. It's in room N112. Uh, it's in person. So, um, let's see. What did I read about? Um, we've shown a few years ago, I did some data analysis, and I showed that students who came to the Chem Gym at least four times over the semester had a 0.5 higher grade in the class than students who didn't come. So we have shown that it, it does help with, with grades. Um, so let me just see, do you guys have any questions for me? Okay, well, I came up with the top five reasons that you should come to Ken Gym. Number five, meet your classmates in person. Number four, it's fun. Number three, it's free. Number two, we will probably improve your grade. And number one, our tutors are smart, friendly, and awesome. So I hope you guys will come. I'm gonna leave some flyers up here up front about the Chem Gym and also just about our regular launch tutoring, which is in person during the day and online at night. It's free, it's drop-in, it's one-on-one. -on -one. And um, if you guys have any questions, my email is on these flyers. You can send me an email. So, any questions before I leave? The one in the back over here. Yes. Um, so for the drop-in tutoring, you said it's online at night. When's this night? Uh, it's um, 5 to 8 p.m. Okay. Yeah. And then the in-person is from 10 to 5 in, on weekdays in our office, which is in Cougar Village 1, uh, room N109. Okay, yes? Uh, for the Ken Gym, we like start going like later in the semester, like at least first couple of weeks, you guys go to Yeah, yeah. It's, we encourage you to come regularly, but you can come, you don't have to like sign up for it, you can just drop in. So you can drop in in a few weeks, that's, that's fine. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you guys. I'm going to leave these flyers up here. Have a good semester. Okay. All right, thanks, Dr. Heidel. And um, so we talked about the importance of getting ahead and not obviously not falling behind is, is a key thing. So even if you feel like you don't need these resources now, it's not a bad idea to start using them before it's too late. Okay. Um, so we are going to go on to our new material today. Uh, as a reminder, the first homework assignment is open and should be due on Sunday, so make sure you get some early attempts on that and any questions you have. So that first assignment will be on Chapter 1, which is what we covered last week. So we're starting today with Chapter 2 already. Chapter 1 was kind of quick, and Chapter 2 is a bit more involved, so we're going to get going with that today. It usually works best if one person is talking at a time. Um, all right, so the... Uh, Last week we talked about atomic structure, that was kind of the thing we closed with, which is the biggest part of that first chapter. Um, the nucleus having protons and neutrons, and then the electrons that at this point we just know are flying around the nucleus in some way. So this chapter two is all about the electrons and 
how they were arranged around the atoms, the energy levels of those electrons, and all those things that were developed a little bit later on in chemistry history. So we're going to take a little brief detour through physics land before we get into that because a lot of the key experiments that were done to understand the behavior of electrons in elements and compounds involved interactions of light with chemical compounds or with matter in general. So we need to understand some things about light or electromagnetic radiation in more general before we can start talking about how some of those you know, ideas came about with regards to the electrons in atoms. All right, so first let's introduce what an electromagnetic wave is. Um, so an electromagnetic wave is also referred to as electromagnetic radiation. Those kind of mean the same thing. And so this is a form of energy that's going to be propagated by electric and magnetic fields that are perpendicular to each other. Now the name sort of tells us that, electromagnetic, so it's pretty obvious that it has an electric, electric field and magnetic field associated with it. Um, but the key, the key point that we'll talk about is that it's um, propagating through space and we're going to talk about some of the properties of those waves here in a little bit. All right, so it's magnetic fields, electric fields that they oscillate in intensity. So that's what makes it a wave. The, the intensity of the, of the fields is not constant in time, but it's oscillating continuously as it propagates through space. So oscillating means that that intensity of the field is going up and down constantly as it moves through space. So we're going to give the full, you know, breakdown of all the different types of electromagnetic radiation a little bit later, but the the different forms of electromagnetic radiation, many of them you're already familiar with in your daily life. So visible light, what allows you to see all the colors and everything else that you see. X-rays, which obviously have a, a pretty um, heavy medical usage. And then radio waves, which I guess nobody listens to the radio anymore because they use their cell phones. But if you're my age, the radio is still important. And then microwaves, which you can use to cook food and other things. Okay, so those are some examples of electromagnetic radiation. As we're going to talk about here in a little bit, what distinguishes these different types of electromagnetic radiation from each other are some key properties of the waves that make them up. So this picture here shows sort of the perpendicular electric field oscillation, which is um, E here, labeled in blue, and then the magnetic field, abbreviated as B, labeled in red. It's not so important that you understand or, or appreciate that three-dimensional picture all the time, but the key point is that you have oscillations in intensity as it travels through space. So let's then talk about the key properties that come about then. Here's a, a generic picture of a wave. We're going to typically just think of the sort of two-dimensional picture just in one direction, not, not trying to, again, worry too much about both electric and magnetic components, which are, are uh, coupled to each other. So the first key um, the first key property is called frequency that I'll introduce. Now frequency is abbreviated with Greek letter nu, which kind of looks like a, a V that has a strong wind blowing into the side of it. So it's like a, a little bit of a tilted V, but it's, it's actually nu, the Greek letter. Um, and what you can think of as frequency is when you're um, you know, drawing a wave like this, you can picture the x-axis, the horizontal axis, in two different ways. So one is a time axis where this is how the intensity changes as the time goes on from left to right. Or you can think about it as a length axis, a distance axis, where, where this is your starting point and this is your ending point for whatever wave you're looking at. So if we imagine that the axis is time, so let's assume here that this bracket represents one second in time. then the frequency of this wave is the number of full oscillations it does in one second. So if, if we start here at the, at the what's called the crest or the peak of the wave and we go through that's one full cycle there, two, three, four. So this wave goes through four full cycles in one second so you would say that the frequency nu is equal to four inverse seconds or what is more often written as four hertz hz the unit for frequency is hertz is named after a, a famous scientist um, so that's what frequency means another way to think of frequency is imagine that you're standing still and a wave is traveling in front of your in front of your face and you're going to see that intensity of that wave go up and down as it's oscillating 
So the number of times that it oscillates in front of your face in one second will be the frequency. So it's going to come in front of your face, you're going to see the intensity going up and down and up and down and up and down. Each individual oscillation going from the top to the bottom back to the top is one cycle. The number of cycles in one second is the frequency of that wave. So that's how you think of frequency. All right, so it's, it's the number of cycles per second. And as we said, the unit for that is called Hertz HZ. Okay, so that's frequency. Now the other, uh, the other key um, parameter for a wave is called wavelength. And again, in this case, we're imagining that the wave is frozen in space and we're measuring the wave in distance from one side to the other. And the wavelength would be the distance between two equivalent points on the wave. So if we start here at one peak in the wave, one crest, and we go to the next peak, which is the next equivalent point, this distance here, if, it's, if this is in distance units, is one wavelength or lambda. Okay, so wavelength is going to be abbreviated as lambda, another Greek letter. So whether you guys like it or not, you're going to learn the Greek alphabet in this class, which I guess you probably already know because of COVID. But anyway, um, we're, going to, we're going to talk about some of the many common abbreviations, and, and lambda is the one for wavelength. Now, that distance can be thought of as the distance between any two equivalent points on the wave. So if you measured it from here to here, the bottom of two waves that are consecutive, the two consecutive um, bottom parts of the wave, the valleys, that would also be lambda, same distance. Or if you go from the midpoint of one wave, which something is called the node, to the next midpoint going through an entire cycle of the wave, that would also be lambda. So it's, it's always going to be the same lambda however you measure it, but it's always the distance between two equivalent points on a wave. And again, to visualize that, imagine that, you're, that you have a wave that's traveling through space and you just freeze it in time where it's not moving, it was where you can't really do, but imagine that's what happens, and then you're just measuring the distance between two equivalent points on the wave. Now, as we'll see, for the types of electromagnetic radiation that we deal with in chemistry, this distance is usually very small on the order of nanometers. So it's not a distance that you could easily appreciate in, in human scale. But at the same time, there are other forms of electromagnetic radiation, like microwave, where the typical distance, the wavelength, is about centimeters, um, or radio waves, where it's on the order of meters, so much larger scale. So the wavelength can span a, a wide range, depending on what kind of electromagnetic radiation you're talking about. Now the other property we'll introduce, although it's not terribly important, but just for completeness we'll include it, is what's called the amplitude. So that's going to be the vertical distance, again if you have a, a wave frozen in space, and it's, it's uh, the vertical distance from the midpoint of the wave to the top, or alternatively from the midpoint to the bottom, would be the same amplitude because the oscillations are identical in the two directions, just, just opposite in sign. Okay, so that's called amplitude A, I'll label it as A here. And there's, again, not much we're going to do with this, just to know what it is, more, more or less, is the important part. So amplitude is the height of the crest. I'm not quite getting the microphone. It's the height of the crest. And what amplitude is sort of related to in terms of the actual properties of the wave as, as you observe it would be the intensity. So if you have a really dim light, you know, a light bulb that's about to die, which I forgot to dim the lights in here. Does anybody care if I do that? Is that important? Seems to be general apathy towards that, so I'll leave the lights as they are, as long as you can see the screen. Um, but anyway, the, if, if you have really bright lights, that would mean the, the amplitude is high. If you have a really dim light that you can barely see, that means the amplitude is low, so that's kind of related to that. It's more complicated than that in real life, and we'll talk about that, but uh, that's kind of what amplitude relates to. Now let's compare two waves now and, and see how the frequencies and the wavelengths relate to each other. So we have two waves drawn here. Wave A, I'll call, is in blue. Wave B is in red. And we're going to just look at the relative wavelengths and frequencies of these two waves. Okay? So if we look at wave A, which is in blue, again, the wavelength is probably the easier one. Let's, let's go from peak to peak in wave A. And we have here a horizontal scale drawn. So if we count how many lines we're moving to go from peak to peak, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So whatever unit we have as our horizontal axis, the wavelength of A is going to be eight in that unit because there's eight divisions, eight little horizontal, well, I guess vertical lines between those two points. And if we go to wave B, which is in red here, 
That would be the wavelength of wave B between the peaks of, of that wave. And we have one, two, three, four horizontal units between that. So the wavelength of B is going to be four on this scale. Whatever the units are, I'm not indicating them here. All right, so that's going to be the, the two wavelengths. And so in terms of the relative values, the wavelength of A is two times the wavelength of B in relative terms. Okay, So that's... Um, how we would how we would measure and, and sort of relate the wavelengths of the two. But now let's see what happens with the frequency. So we're going to take the same two waves and see how the frequencies are related to each other. So again, for frequency, we're now going to imagine that the horizontal axis is a time axis where the wave is passing in front of us as a function of time. And again, we go we, we just have to define the same horizontal time uh, interval for each wave and count how many cycles there are. So if we if we use this as our starting and ending point here where we're counting how many cycles each wave goes through in that period of time. Let's count them for wave A, which is in blue. So for A, we're going to go from the top here to the bottom back to the top. That's one cycle. Top, bottom, back to the top. That's two cycles. So wave A goes through two cycles in that unit of time. If we assume it's one second in that unit of time, that, that would be two hertz. And then for wave B, which is in red, we're going to look at the same period of time and see how many oscillations, how many cycles wave B does in that time. So we start also at the uh, peak for wave B and we go one, two, three, four. So wave B has four cycles in the same unit of time, which means that the frequency for wave B is two times the frequency of wave A, or alternatively, if we're doing it in terms of A, then frequency for A is one half times the frequency of B. Okay, so B is oscillating twice as fast as A, which means that its frequency is twice as high. Now, the point of showing this is not that you're going to have to do problems like this, but it's to understand the to start to understand the relationship between wavelength and frequency. So, what you can see is that the wavelength of A is two times the wavelength of B, but the frequency of A is only half the frequency of B. So there's an inverse relationship between the two. If the wavelength is higher, the frequency is smaller. If the frequency is higher, the wavelength is smaller, and vice versa, all those uh, relationships. That's called an inverse relationship, where one parameter gets larger, the other parameter gets smaller in a relative sense. And that's going to be important in a couple of slides when we start talking about the mathematical relationship between wavelength and frequency. And then this slide, I don't know why I keep it, but let's just look at some comparisons of waves that have two different amplitudes. Um, so again, for the amplitude, we go from the midpoint of the wave, which is here, to the crest of the wave, or the valley if you go down, either way. And so we can see for A, the amplitude is one, two vertical units, whatever that scale is. Again, amplitude is sort of arbitrarily defined anyway. And then for B, if we start at the same midpoint and go to the peak of B, that's only one of those vertical units. And so in whatever the scale is, the amplitude of B is one. And again, the only conclusion we can really draw from that is that wave A here in blue is brighter or more intense than wave B. All right, I don't want to dwell on that because I don't think there's any homework questions that deal with amplitude, but I just wanted to include that for completeness. All right, but the key relationship which we developed in the last slide is between wavelength and frequency. So let's talk about that mathematically now in more, more specific detail. So what we saw is that wavelength and frequency are inversely related. Again, what that means is if the wavelength is longer, the frequency is smaller. If the frequency is, is larger, the wavelength is smaller. So there's an inverse relationship. So the way that we write that mathematically is lambda is proportional to, so another uh, sign that means proportional to, it's not, e it's not an equality, but it's a proportionality, one over the frequency. So whenever you have an inverse relationship, that's what it means, that it's proportional to the reciprocal, or one over the other, other parameter. So wavelength and frequency are inversely related, so that's how you'd write it out. And then if you want to turn something that's a proportionality into an equality, so if we want to replace this, this little proportionality sign, this alpha here, with an equal sign, what you have to do is add a constant to one side of the equation. Um, and in reality, you can add a constant to either side, but the way that it's defined conventionally is we're going to put a constant on the right side of the equation and say that lambda is equal to C, a constant, divided by the frequency nu. So you just put a constant on one side, and that allows you to, to change the proportionality into an equal sign. 
And then we rearrange this in the more typical way, which is to say that lambda times the frequency, or sorry, frequency times wavelength, nu times lambda, is equal to c. And c here is a, a very special and very well-known constant, which is the speed of light. All right. And this constant is on the periodic table that we give you for exams. So you don't have to memorize it, but you'll use it so much that you'll probably will memorize it whether you try to or not. And that's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now that's the speed in a vacuum, meaning there's no other molecules around, no air molecules or no, no liquid that is traveling through. The speed of light changes as you go through different medium, but we're not going to worry about that here. We just need to know that value for the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So that's the speed of light, and, in the, in the, and then if you take the product of frequency and wavelength for any type of electromagnetic radiation, that product will equal that speed of light C. So that's how you would always then determine one from the other. So if you know the frequency, you can determine the wavelength and vice versa. And as we then will talk about now, what distinguishes the different types of electromagnetic radiation is their wavelength and frequency, which are closely related to each other. You can't change one without changing the other. And so you should know the order of the scale that I'm showing here. Um, you don't know to know, need to know the numbers and the divisions between them, which are a little bit cloudy and arbitrary anyway, but you should know the order that the different types of electromagnetic radiation fall onto. So the highest frequency or smallest wavelength electromagnetic radiation are gamma rays over here on the left. So here in this, on this scale, wavelength increases left to right, frequency increases right to left, again they're opposite of each other. So gamma ray is the smallest wavelength and the highest frequency, and then radio waves are at the other extreme. They have the longest wavelength and the, um, and the smallest frequency. So again, as we said, the, the, um, the wavelength for radio waves, this is in nanometers, so they're on the order of you know, 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 12th nanometers, that's on the order of meters. So wavelength for radio waves is huge, it's, it's sometimes you know, bigger than you are. Um, and then we have everything else in between, so gamma rays and x-rays and ultraviolet, those are the, th the three highest energy forms. And then visible, which is the portion of the electromagnetic radiation that we can see with our eyes, is a very small slice in the middle. So this is the visible range shown here is a very small slice, and then below the visible range in frequency or above that in wavelength, we have infrared. Infra means below red, and so that's, that's the form of energy that's lower in energy than red light, and then microwave and radio waves after that. So you should know this order here in this gray scale, and you should also have at least an approximate picture of the, the, the wavelengths of light that correspond to the visible range. So if you can't see this because it's a little bit small, the visible range starts at about 400 nanometers. That would be sort of your your blue or violet light that you can see. With, and then here they're showing it out to 750 nanometers. Um, that's a little bit generous. In reality, I don't think humans can see much beyond 700. Obviously, people's vision varies a little bit from person to person, but around that range, 400 to 700 or so, that's the visible range, a relatively small part of the visible spectrum. And it follows that typical order that you probably learned back in middle school, the Roy G. Biv. You know, but here it's written op in the opposite direction, but Roy, red, is going to be the longest wavelength or the smallest frequency visible, and then green, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and then at the high end of the scale in terms of frequency or the low end in terms of wavelength is the violet or blue. So, so that's going to be the visible scale. Um, which is particularly important in a chemistry context. A lot of the you know, things we'll talk about related to chemistry involve light that's in the visible region or maybe just beyond the visible region in the ultraviolet or infrared. Those are kinds of the parts of the spectrum that are most commonly encountered in, in, a, in a chemistry context. All right, so any questions on that, the sort of definition of electromagnetic radiation or, or how we classify them in this way? All right, so that's gonna be a little bit of memorization, but not too bad. But the main thing you're gonna have to do in this part of the, of the chapter, which you'll see homework questions and test questions related to, is some of these equations you know, for electromagnetic radiation that relate wavelength and frequency, and then one other one we're gonna give you in a little bit. So let's just do a couple practice problems with that. The math is very easy, you just have to be careful with units on these problems. That's something that I'll emphasize over and over throughout the course. And so if we have this problem here, um, it looks yeah, I guess it kind of it looks more red on my screen. I guess my screen's not quite great. This is more like orange. It should be orange. It looks kind of red. But anyway, if you have 600 nanometer light that's orange to red in color, and we want to know what is the frequency of that light. All right. So again, now that we have that equation that relates wavelength and frequency, if I give you one, you can always find the other uh, with a pretty simple 
algebraic operation. So again, the, the product of the two, nu times lambda equals the speed of light, and we're just solving here for the frequency, which is what we don't know. So frequency is going to be the speed of light c divided by the wavelength lambda. Now we have to be very careful with units. I know there's um, there's always every every class I teach there's some some math whizzes who just go straight to their calculator and start punching numbers in, and then usually not usually but often they mess up because they don't keep track of what units are the numbers that they're putting in. So if you just divide the two numbers, you're going to be in trouble because what we'll notice again is that the speed of light here is 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So if we want the length unit to divide out in this expression, that means lambda also has to be in meters. We cannot just put it in, in nanometers, okay? So it's given to us in nanometers. That's the most common unit for, uh, for wavelength in the, in, this, in the types of, you know, the parts of the spectrum that we'll talk about. So we need to do a quick conversion here to convert lambda into meters. So you do need to know some of these prefixes, nano, micro, milli, stuff like that. Nano is 10 to the ninth, so really 10 to the minus nine is a more accurate way of saying it. But basically for, for to convert nanometers to meters, we have 600 nanometers. And there's two ways to write the conversion factor. So what we want is we want nanometers in the denominator to cancel out and then meters in the numerator to convert into that unit. And there's two ways of writing it. Whatever you're more comfortable with is fine with me. I prefer to work with positive exponents myself, but that's just personal preference. So I would write this as 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter, okay? Um, but the other way that you could write this, and you'll get the same number, 600 nanometers, and you're still gonna put meters on the top, nanometers on the bottom, Nano technically means 10 to the minus 9, so you could write it as 10 to the minus 9 meters in one nanometer. Those are mathematically equivalent, it's whatever you prefer to remember how, I think the top one's a little bit easier to deal with on a calculator usually, so that's why I do positive exponents, but it's up to you, either of these is the same, and however you do this, what you would get then is that the wavelength in the correct unit of meters is 6.000, for, if we're being, accurate with significant figures, times 10 to the minus 7 meters. All right, But again, do a lot of these practice problems, you'll get to appreciate that if you have a typical wavelength that's on the order of 100, hundreds of nanometers, in meters that should be around 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 6, somewhere in there. So if you get something that's way different than that, that probably means you messed up your conversion factor or put in the calculator wrong. All right, so either of those works, one meter over 10 to the ninth nanometers or 10 to the minus nine meters over one nanometer, and they get you to that value of, of the wavelength in the correct units. So now we can put that back up here into this equation. Sorry, wrong exponent. I was getting ahead of myself. That's minus seven, as we just did. And so the final answer when we divide those out and again, you have to use scientific calculators on your exam, so make sure you know how to do the exponents on those proficiently. And you get 5 times 10 to the 14th hertz, which you may also write, and specify the unit here, but you could write that as 500 terahertz. All right. Um, so in a, in a Blackboard problem, we would specify what unit you should report the answer in, of course, but um, those, either of those would be, would be fine. Um, numerically, they're the same. And that's how you do it. All right, so any questions on that? Yes? How did you convert the units? So how I converted the units was recognizing that this little lowercase n here stands for nano, and nano, oh, which unit are you talking about? This conversion down here or the, or the terahertz? So again, that would be, a, a, so tera is 10 to the 12th. So if you have 5 times 10 to the 14th, that's equal to 500 times 10 to the 12th, which converted as terahertz. Again, we would, we don't use those mega and tera as much, but you'll have to learn these prefixes here to be able to do that, um, which is particularly important in this part of the course is where we'll use a lot of those. So this is table R2. It might look a little bit different in your book because this is from an older version, but it should have the same information, where again, we have a bunch of these different prefixes that go in front of units and that modify the magnitude of that unit by a certain factor. Um, the ones in blue are the ones that are that are most commonly encountered in this course. So you should definitely know the ones that are in blue here. The other ones we probably won't see, um, or at least if we do, we'll define them for you. So Terra is this one here, which is 10 to the 12th. That's not a very common one, but it's one way you could write that same answer in in a different frequency, you know, as a more 
round number, I suppose. But in this chapter especially, you should know nano for sure. And you might see some of these other ones as well. But nano, nanometers you're going to see all the time, so make sure you know that one if nothing else. But you should know, you should know all of these. It's, they're important in all areas of science, not just chemistry. And especially the ones in blue are, are commonly encountered um, in, in you know, chemistry context. All right, and you might see, you know, so kilo, you've probably heard of kilograms, that's a thousand grams. So those prefixes just modify the unit by a certain factor. Um, and you should know what you should know all of those. All right, any questions on that? All right, let's do, uh, let's move on then to the next topic here, which is the quantization of energy. So now we can understand a little bit about the properties of electromagnetic radiation. And there was, you know, there was a period of time, kind of looking back in history around the early 1900s, when, you know, physicists and to some extent chemists, they kind of all were under the belief that we kind of understand everything now, you know, the world is pretty well understood, we might, we know, we might tweak things here and there, but they were expecting not much new things to come out. But then there were some experiments that kind of turned the physics and chemistry world on their head, and the, the first of those that we'll talk about is... Uh, what's called black body radiation. All right, so again, people thought that every, you know, physics is a solved problem, pack up your bags, go home, it's, we're not needed anymore. But then some other, you know, some physicists started doing some experiments and, and found some very unexpected things. So let's first talk about the concept of black body radiation. You probably have encountered this in your everyday life if you've ever used an electric stove or a wood burner. So if you heat something up to metal in particular to really high temperatures, it starts glowing. Okay, so if you've ever seen an electric stove heated up to its maximum setting, you'll start to see a red or even yellow glow coming off of that of that metal from the stove. All right, so what it, what it tells us is that a solid, and usually this is again metals that would not easily burn, but um, any solid in principle can do this. If you heat it to very high temperatures, And we're talking on the order of a thousand Kelvin, which is several hundred degrees Celsius and several hundred degrees Fahrenheit, so it's a pretty high temperature. That heated solid will start to emit visible light. And to some extent, that's the concept in incandescent light bulbs, which I guess the government outlawed a while ago, but you might still see them here and there. Um, so anyway, anything you heat up really high temperature, you'll start to see it glow. That's the concept. Now that wasn't that was known for a long time. That wasn't the surprising part. The problem they ran into and what sort of caused them to scratch their heads is that if you use classical physics, what classical physics says is that matter can absorb or emit any quantity of, of energy. All right. So class so sorry, classical physics. All right, so they recognize that you know black body radiation. You're you're giving the material energy in the form of heat. It's releasing energy in the form of light. And according to classical physics, that material can can absorb or emit any quantity of energy. In other words, energy would be continuous in that case. But the problem is when they use classical physics and they try to explain and, and predict, you know, what would the intensity of all the different wavelengths of black body radiation look like? So again, they were measuring and, and, and sort of predicting for black body radiation, you heat something up, it gives off light, and you measure the intensity at every wavelength. And they predicted what that would look like based on classical physics, but the measurement was way different from that. And basically, so, so this classical physics fails to explain the observed wavelength intensity relationship for black body radiation. All right, and again, so this was a classic situation where the experiment and the theory don't match, which means that the theory does not tell the whole story or, or is outright wrong. So it fails to explain the wavelength intensity relationship of black body radiation. So these concepts are I'll, I'll warn you as we go through a few of the things in today's lecture, they're a little bit hard to wrap your head around fully, so we don't want you guys to know like, all the details or get too bogged down and everything, but again, just know the importance of them and know sort of 
the concept that emerged as a solution to these problems. So again, this was the first problem that when you study the wavelengths that are given off by black body radiation, the intensity at each wavelength, that profile of intensity versus wavelength, doesn't quite match what you would expect based on classical physics. So the solution that Max Planck came up with, a famous German scientist who now has a whole university system named after him in Germany, um, so he's kind of like the Cullen of Germany, has everything named after him now. Um, so Max Planck, is his solution was that the energy is actually quantized in whole number multiples of a constant times a frequency. So in other words, you can't have any old value of energy coming off of the black body solid. There has to be just discrete units of energy that come off. They're very tiny units, but nonetheless, you can't, they're not continuous. So it's quantized in whole number multiples of a constant h times the frequency. Okay, so h now bears the name Planck's, Planck's constant, or Planck's constant as we pronounce it in American English, um, where delta e, the, the energy that's being, that the energy change for that system as it's absorbing and emitting a radiation is equal to some whole number n times that, h times the frequency. And h is an extremely small number, 6.626, times 10 to the minus 34, and these are joules times seconds. And we call that again Planck's constant. So that's on your periodic table as well, but you'll use it a lot, so you'll probably learn it. And so what this tells us is that the energy that's given off by black body radiation is not continuous, but it's in little packets of energy that are given by h times the frequency. Tiny, tiny little units of energy, but nonetheless not any random value that you can come up with. Where again, in this equation up here, n is an integer. So the energy values, the energy differences as the black body radiation is emitted are in whole number multiples of h times the frequency. So whether you learn all the details or not, the key thing about this black body radiation experiment was it was sort of the first observation that led to the idea that the energy in matter and the energy of light that's produced by matter is quantized in little individual packets of energy, not continuous. All right, and that was driven home further, and I think is even more clear in the con in the concept of in the context of light and electromagnetic radiation when we talk about the photoelectric effect. So the photoelectric effect was studied by a scientist who you may have heard of. His name is Albert Einstein. Um, this is one of his many contributions. And photoelectric effect. Here's the here's the experiment we're doing here. Just illustrated in this picture here on the right. All right. So the concept behind this. So people were shining light on a metal surface. And what they sometimes observe is when the light hits the metal surface, electrons come off of that surface. They, they eject electrons. So that, that, was, that happens some of the time and not all the time. And so that's what this picture over here on the right says. Okay, we're going to use blue light, 400 nanometers. Shine it on the surface, boom, electron comes off. Green light, shine it on the surface, boom, electron comes off. Red light, shine it on the surface, nothing happens. And again, that was puzzling to them. They were thinking, like, why, you know, why is it if we change the, the color or the wavelength of the light, why do the electrons no longer come off? So that was the big problem is that the light they found must have a minimum threshold frequency in order for this to happen. So that minimum frequency that they need to eject an electron is called the threshold frequency. And if you're below that, nothing happens. And that doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter how intense the light is. You can turn the light up, you know, as high as you want. You're not going to see that if the frequency is too low. All right, and again, because the, the classical picture was that the energy in light was continuous, and so if you didn't see it happening, they'd be like, well, just turn up the dial, you know, turn it up to 11, see what happens. Um, and nothing happened still as long as that frequency was below that threshold value. So again, that was, that was puzzling to people back then. 
And so Einstein's solution to this is that light itself consists of particles or little packets of energy called photons. So light has wavelength, wave like properties, which we've already talked about, frequency and wavelength being the wave like properties of light. But it also behaves like a particle in some sense. It's made up of little packets called a photon. And this is entirely analogous to how matter elements are all made of atoms, these little tiny pieces of matter that you can't break down any further. And similarly, light is made up of photons, little tiny packets of energy that you can't break down any further. So it's a, an analogy, you know, a wave particle duality where everything in reality, and light in particular in this experiment, has both wave properties and properties that behave like matter. And so in this case, you know, light or any electromagnetic radiation is made up of what are called photons, which are analogous to atoms, but, but of course um, behave a lot differently. And so then the equation that relates to this is that the energy of the photon, of a single photon, is equal to the same thing I showed you earlier, h times the frequency. So again, Planck's constant h multiplied by the frequency of that electromagnetic radiation gives you the energy of one single photon. All right, and that can be then rewritten also as h times the speed of light divided by lambda. This is just combining the two equations that you now have. All right, so in reality, there's only two equations for photons you need to know. The first one that we already worked with, the wavelength times the frequency equals c, and then this one here, the energy is equal to h times the frequency, and if you combine those two, you get an alternative form, hc over lambda. Okay, so that's the key equation that comes out of this, which again says that the energy of an individual photon is this much here. And the reason this relates then back to the photoelectric effect is when light collides with the surface, one photon collides with one electron to eject that electron. And so if the energy of that one photon is too small, the electron sticks to the surface and doesn't get ejected. But if the energy of the photon is high enough, you will hit the surface and eject the electron. And then the brighter the light, the more photons you have, the more electrons that come off. But they all come off with the same speed. So the kinetic energy of the electron, you don't need to use this equation, but it helps illustrate the concept more of the photoelectric effect. When you eject the electron from the surface, it's going to come off with some velocity. So if you've taken physics, you know that kinetic energy is equal to 1 half times mv squared, where m is the mass and v is the velocity. And you can predict that for the photoelectric effect by taking h times nu, which is the photon frequency, or photon energy, I should say, and then you subtract from that h times nu zero, where this is nu zero is that threshold frequency. All right, and so what this says is that if you shine light on a surface, if the frequency is too low, if it's below nu zero, nothing happens. There's not enough energy for you to kick an electron off the surface. If the energy is higher than that, whatever that excess energy is, the energy of the photon minus the threshold energy, that's going to equal the kinetic energy of the ejected electron. So the higher the frequency of the photon, the higher the energy of the photon, the faster the electrons come off. But nonetheless, um, it's all related to the frequency of the photon, not anything else. All right, again, you're not going to use this bottom equation here. It's not, it's not in any of the homework questions. We don't ask you to do these types of calculations, but that helps illustrate the concept a little bit better. Okay, so that was the second one that dealt with the quantization of energy. Um, and again, I, the idea that electromagnetic radiation is made up of little packets of energy called photons, and the energy of an individual photon is given as shown here. All right, and then the last one, which was um, in purely theoretical, is the de Broglie wavelength. Um, so this is, I think he got the Nobel Prize for this, but if not, he, I mean, if, if um, it was at, at that level, I think this is one of the world's shortest PhD theses ever. So he got a PhD for this work in about a two-page paper um, where he just derived this equation and was like, you know, that's it, I'm done. And, you know, it's, but it was, again, a very impactful discovery and very, but all, all theoretical, but it, it does, has since been proven experimentally. All right, so the idea here with the de Broglie wavelength is that, um, so Einstein came up with another famous equation, E equals mc squared. I'll remember Einstein's name so you guys remember that, but you guys know that. So Einstein had come up with this 
famous equation, E equals mc squared, which says that the en that energy and mass are closely related to each other. They're not two separable quantities necessarily. And c is still that speed of light. And so then what you can do is you can solve for the apparent mass of a photon. So, uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation doesn't have mass conventionally. It's, you know, in a classical sense, it's electromagnetic radiation. It's pure energy. It doesn't have mass. But using this relationship, you can solve for what the apparent mass of a photon is. So the mass of a photon is just E divided by C squared. And we know from the equation we just talked about that the energy of a photon is hc over lambda. So we put that in the numerator here for energy E. hc divided by lambda is the energy of a photon. Divide that by c squared. And that simplifies to h over lambda times c. So that's the apparent mass of a photon. Now, again, photons are not matter. Light is not made up of atoms and is not, does not have defined mass. But nonetheless, it has that sort of particle-like property and apparent mass that's associated with its wavelength and frequency. And so what this means is that for any form of matter, it doesn't matter the, wave, the length scale you're talking about, any form of matter also has a wavelength associated with it. So again, this is that idea of wave-particle duality. There is no clear separation between matter and energy. In, in some sense, they're all the same. Everything has wavelength properties. Everything has particle-like properties. Which ones of those are more important depends on the type of, of matter and the type of energy that you're studying. Okay, but for matter, the wavelength is given as, we just solve this equation here, is h divided by mass times velocity. Now, the, the question is, well then why don't we, you know, why don't we see this? Why doesn't everything that we observe in everyday life have a wavelength associated with it. Why can't we see oscillations of everything? Well, the reason is because it's all about it's all about the size scale that you're working on here. All right, so let's say let's say I take a baseball, which I don't know has a mass of a few hundred grams probably. And you know, back in my athletic prime, I could probably throw that to the back of the room with a speed of about 70 miles an hour. Now, if I put those numbers into here, the mass of a baseball, which is a few hundred grams, the velocity in, in meters per second, which is about 30 meters per second, remember that h is an exceptionally tiny number. So the wavelength of a baseball as it travels through space is going to be something like you know, 10 to the minus 30 meters or something like that. Exceptionally small compared to the size of the baseball. So you don't see that wavelength or you don't observe that very easily because it's just way smaller than the object itself. So for you know, normal matter on the size scales that we can see with our eyes, we don't notice the wave-like properties because the object is way too big and the wavelength is way too small for us to be able to see that. But if you start studying really tiny things like electrons, which are exceptionally small, the wavelength of an electron is actually significant compared to the size of the electron and the size of the atoms that the electron is located in. And so now you'll start to see some of those wave-like properties. And that's some ideas we're going to extend further as we talk about electrons in more detail. So as you go to really tiny time, uh, sorry, really tiny size scales like you would deal with in atoms and subatomic particles like electrons, all of a sudden those wave-like properties become more important. And to understand the properties of an electron in full, you need to consider the idea that it also has associated wave-like properties in addition to its, its mass and sort of you know particle-like properties. So that was the idea of the of the wave-particle duality that de Broglie came up with. So let's summarize all of this as best as we can. Again, the concepts are kind of difficult, but we'll, we'll do our best to simplify things. So basically, matter and energy both have dual particle and, wa and, and wave-like properties. So Particulate, meaning they behave like particles, and wave properties, they behave like waves. So everything behaves as both. There is no clear separation. And as we go forward and talk about electrons in more detail, that's especially important to realize that because electrons are tiny, these wavelength properties are important. And a key experiment that came out later on and sort of validated this de Broglie theory, again, de Broglie's work was purely theoretical. It was just pencil and paper. Here's what I think. Here's combining some ideas and getting these equations out. And then they you know, set about to validate some of this. And the key experiment to validate this was diffraction. So the definition of diffraction is that it's, it was conventionally observed with light, and it's the scattering of light 
by a regular array of points or lines. So again, if you've taken physics in high school or here, you may have done these experiments before. You shine light on what's called a diffraction grating, which has really small lines on it, and the light sort of spreads out in all directions. That's diffraction. And it's been observed in the light for a long time. But then what was found more recently, we don't need to go into any more details than this, is that electrons are also diffracted. Now in that case, you can't do it with a conventional diffraction grating, but they are diffracted by crystals. Because as we'll learn much later in the course, a crystal is just a series of atoms that are all lined up in a regular order and the same, with the same spacing between them. If you shine electrons at a crystal, they diffract. So that's a wave-like property of electrons that was observed experimentally after de Broglie had sort of hypothesized or theorized that everything would exhibit wave-like properties. So electrons, which are exceptionally tiny, as we talked about last week, they have wave-like properties that you can clearly observe in experiments like electron diffraction. Okay, so that takes us to the end of the physics part. Let's just do a few sample problems dealing with electromagnetic radiation and waves now that we have sort of both equations to work with. So let's talk about red laser pointers, which have a wavelength of 635 nanometers. We want to know what is the energy of a single photon that is 635 nanometers. So again, we now have this equation here. The energy of a photon is h times the frequency, which can also be written as hc over lambda. You can always use either one of these equations, just which one is more convenient depends on what you're given. Here we're given the wavelengths. Let's go ahead and use the hc over lambda directly, but if you wanted to convert to frequency first and then use a the second equation, that's fine also. So the energy of the photon is h, so let's just start writing out the information, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Again, that constant is on your periodic table, so you don't need to memorize it, but you probably will. C is the same speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth. I think it might be written on your constant sheet as like 2.998 or something, but three is fine. You don't have to get that precise. Um, and then we have to put wavelength in the denominator, but again, C is in meters per second, so we need our, for these equations as well, we need wavelength to be in the standard SI unit of meters. So you have to do the same conversion that we did last time, where we need to get lambda in meters. So we start with what's given, which is 635 nanometers, and then multiply by whichever form of that conversion factor we, we like best. One meter is 10 to the ninth nanometers, and that gives us 6.35 times 10 to the minus seven meters for the wavelength, which we can now plug into this equation up here. And then when we multiply that out and divide, we get 3.13 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. All right, and again, the number hopefully helps emphasize the point that I made earlier, which is that an individual photon is a very, very, very tiny piece of energy. But every, you know, this whole beam of 635 nanometer light is gonna be an energy that's some whole number multiple times that, um, times that small packet of energy there. That's the energy of a single photon of red light. You can't break it down any further than that. So in problems like this, which you will, you're gonna use this equation both by itself in problems like this, and then there's um, a concept we'll start introducing at the end of today and continue next time where this equation is also important. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll just the warning I'll give is most people that make mistakes on this, they make one of two mistakes. Either, um, most often they just don't get the units right, that's what we already talked about or they don't know the proper syntax for exponents on their calculator. So make sure you know that and practice it with the calculator you're going to use on the exam. Because every calculator is a little bit different. Um, sometimes students ask me to help figure them out and it takes me a while too for some calculators. They're not all intuitive and they're not all the same. So make sure you practice with whatever calculator you're going to use because the, the, the syntax for exponents can be a little bit tricky at times and don't get tripped up by that. It's a, a silly reason to, to miss a point in an exam. Okay, so that's going to be the um, way that we'd use that equation for the energy of a photon. And then let's do it one more time, but take it one step further. So let's say we have a green laser pointer this time, and green laser pointers have a wavelength of about 520 nanometers. I want to know how many photons do we need to produce two joules of energy? So let's say I shine this um, green laser pointer, I won't shine it in your eyes, on the, on the wall until two joules of light energy have hit the wall that I'm shining the light on. We want to know how many photons is that equivalent to, how many photons hit the wall to give us two joules of energy. 
again, joules is the standard unit for energy. So again, for this problem here, what we have to do is we're going to find the energy of an individual photon that has a wavelength of 520 nanometers, and then we're going to figure out how many photons do we need to give us two joules. All right, so we're going to use that first equation that we did last time once again. The energy of one photon is H times C divided by lambda. And we just have to plug in the numbers that were given. Two constants on the top. And then in the bottom, we need the wavelength, but again, it needs to be converted to meters. We should know by now that if we take hundreds of nanometers and convert to meters, that's going to be 10 to the minus 7, so I won't go through those steps again. We have to, we have to divide by 10 to the 9th to get nanometers to meters. And that gives us the energy of one photon, 3.82 times 10 to the minus 19. So again, that's joules per photon. One photon has that much energy in terms of joules. So now we want to find out how many photons are equivalent to two joules of energy. There's a few ways we can set up that second step, but here's the way that I like to do it. We're looking for a number of photons. So let's write that out. We're told that we're looking, we're, we're, we're producing 2.00 joules of energy, and we have this relationship here, which is the energy of one photon. So we can almost use that as a conversion factor. So from this uh, calculation we did above, one photon has an energy of 3.82 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So joules divide out, and that gives us then how many photons are equivalent to that, which is 5.23 times 10 to the 18th. So a huge number of photons. Again, photons are a very tiny amount of energy individually, and so if you're going to produce a reasonable amount of energy using a light source or a laser pointer as it is here, you need a lot of photons to do that. They're very tiny in terms of the amount of energy they produce. Now the other way that you could write this is that, um, you know, a lot of you like to use proportionalities. So two joules over x photons is equivalent to 3.82 times 10 to the minus 19th joules over one photon. So you could do the same, you could do it that way too if you prefer. I like to write things out using the factor label method, and especially for stuff we do later in the course where there's multiple steps involved, I think this is preferable. But if you want to do it as a proportionality, you should get the same answer as well if you prefer to think of things in those terms. Okay, but that's how you do it. You figure out the energy of one photon, and you figure out how many photons you need to give that two joules of energy. And again, it's a lot of photons because each photon is, is tiny in terms of its energy. All right, any questions on that? So what we're going to move on to now is one more practice problem before we get to some new stuff. Um, how about I, let me actually let you guys try this. I always do them myself, and then I'm like, why do I call it you try one if I do it myself? So try this one out on your own, and I'll, I'll put it in the notes so that you can look back at it um, when you go through the notes later on if you choose to do that. So just try this one out on your, on your own, see if you get the right answer, and, um, and then if you have any questions on it, I'll explain it to you individually. But I want to move on to the next stuff now, which is now we're going to finally talk about some of the key ideas and the key experiments that led us to understand how electrons are arranged in atoms. So all the stuff we've talked about so far, this idea of wave-particle duality, it kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about now where, you know, again, energy levels are, are quantized and also the energy of, of electromagnetic radiation is quantized in little packets called photons. And then we you know, can look at now some observations dealing with, um, you know, dealing with matter and how we had to start thinking about the arrangement of electrons in, that, uh, in those atoms to, to explain some of those observations. So if you have white light, which you know, comes from the sun or comes from a light bulb or, or, or so on, um, and you put it through a prism, if you've ever done this type of experiment before, I think my, my mom used to have a prism hanging in the window so we'd see it you know, all the time at home. When you split white light, you get all the different wavelengths of, of visible light. So when you split white light or continuous light, as it's called, in a prism, you get all visible wavelengths. And of course, we call that a rainbow. So if you've seen a rainbow, that's essentially what's happening. White light is going through the, the droplets of rain in some way, and it's splitting it off into all the different colors that make up that. And that would be a continuous spectrum where you see all the different colors of light and they're all sort of smeared together in, in the, the typical pattern of red, orange, yellow, green, and so on. 
That's what happens with, with white light. But then if we, if we generate light using a single element like hydrogen, so uh, the key concept here is that when you energize substances, we talk about this in the context of black body, but it's more general than that. But when substances are energized, they give off light. Now the way that this was studied, these, you know, when you talk about the, you know, the spectrum of hydrogen as we're going to talk about now, basically the way they did the experiment was they filled, essentially a light bulb was filled with hydrogen and they put a bunch of electricity through it. So that's how they energize the hydrogen, by giving it a ton of electricity. It's kind of the same way that fluorescent light bulbs work today. Where you have you have a gas or, or you know neon bulbs if you've heard of those neon signs you have a gas inside of a inside of a bulb you electrify it give it a bun bunch of energy in the form of electricity and then it generates light as it um, you know as that is as that energy is, is given to it now when you do that with hydrogen so it produces light you can put it through a prism and, and observe it but it doesn't give you every wavelength of light it doesn't give you this continuous rainbow it just gives you a few sharp lines only four wavelengths total in the whole visible range so when you do this with hydrogen and, and same for other substances it's just you get different wavelengths but with hydrogen in particular which we're going to talk about you, you generate light with hydrogen but when you split that with a prism only a few sharp lines are observed and each corresponds to a discrete wavelength. And it doesn't matter how you energize that hydrogen or how many times you repeat the experiment, you're always gonna get the same four wavelengths every time. It's always these four wavelengths. And you don't, as I said, you don't get the continuous rainbow that you get with regular white light. So that was, again, an observation that was puzzling at the time. Why are we only getting a few wavelengths? Why are we not getting all possible wavelengths? And this again led to the idea that energy levels in atoms are also quantized, that they're at discrete levels. You can't just have any continuous energy for the electrons that are, that are in there. So what this led to then, this observation and the way that you can kind of explain it then, is what's called the Bohr model of the atom. So this was the first attempt to explain the arrangement of electrons around an atom. Now, as we'll learn in not too long, this is not quite correct, but some of the, the mathematical relationships that came out of it are valid and useful, and some of the concepts are so important to lead to the more sort of advanced treatment of electrons that we'll get to a little bit later. So here's the Bohr model of the atom, and it, it deals specifically with hydrogen atom or anything else that has one electron. Hydrogen is the only element that has one electron, of course. There are some ions that would have just one electron as well, but it deals with one electron systems. In our case, we're just going to do it for hydrogen and not talk about the, you know, the effects of having other elements besides hydrogen. So the hydrogen atom only has certain energy levels for the electrons. Right? And again, this is the idea that the energy levels in an atom are not continuous, but rather are quantized at specific energy levels. And what determines these energy levels, and this is the part that is not quite correct, unfortunately, but it is part of this Bohr model, so we should learn it. They are determined by fixed circular orbits of the electron around the nucleus. So again, hydrogen has just one electron, so we don't have to worry about anything else. And the energy levels that this electron can, can sit at are determined by how close it is to the nucleus and it's always going in a regular circular orbit. So this is often referred to as the planetary model of the atom. You have the nucleus at the center, which is like your sun, and the electron is just circling around that in a regular orbit. And the other key thing is that it can't be any distance from the nucleus, it's only certain distances that are allowed, which is why you only get those few certain energy levels as well. All right. Now another key point of the Bohr model is that an atom's energy does not change as long as the electron remains in that same circular orbit. All right, so as long as the electron is circling around the, the nucleus and it's that same distance from the nucleus, the energy doesn't change. But then the energy of the electron does change in two different ways. So the electron can move to a different orbit, a different distance from the nucleus, 
And I can do it in two ways. All right, again, so that means it's going to move to an orbit that's further away from the nucleus if it's going to higher energy. And it does that by absorbing or emitting a photon. All right, so if it absorbs a photon, it takes the energy from that photon and moves to a higher energy orbit around the nucleus further away. Or if it goes from a higher energy orbit back down to a lower energy orbit, it emits that extra energy in the form of a photon. So in any case, the energy of the photon that is involved in that process is equal to the absolute value of the change in energy for the electron. Which again is given as the absolute value of the final energy minus the initial energy. The energy that it ends up as minus the energy that it starts as, as an absolute value because energy, photon energies are always positive. You can have a negative energy for a photon. But the electron energy can either increase or decrease depending on whether it's going further away from the nucleus, in which case it's increasing, or moving closer to the nucleus in a smaller orbit, in which case it's decreasing. So anytime you see the capital delta here, another Greek letter for your alphabet, um, there was a delta variant of COVID, so you probably heard that one. It looks like a triangle. Um, and delta just means final minus initial. Anytime you see delta in chemistry, it means final minus initial, okay? So the, the delta energy for the electron, the change in energy for the electron is its final minus initial energy. That absolute value, that difference between the two is equal to the energy of the photon that's either absorbed or emitted. We'll, we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Now there's some more terminology associated with the Bohr model that we need to address before we get into it. So the first is what are called quantum numbers. So in the Bohr model, there's only one quantum number you have to worry about, which is abbreviated as n. And they're positive integers, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So it's always a, an integer number starting at 1. And what these do is these define the energy levels and the radius of the orbit. Now we'll see an equation here, if we get to it today, I don't know if we'll get that far today or not. There's an equation that has n in it that, that deals specifically with the energy levels, and, and there is one for the radius as well that we won't cover. But these positive integers are associated with the radius of an electron orbit. And again, this underscores the idea that the orbit of the electron and its energy level cannot be any random value. They're spaced by these even integer values, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Again, these, this quantum number for the Bohr model is abbreviated as n, which we will see in the equation that I'll give you in a little bit. And again, the radius and energy both depend on n. And they're not continuous values because n has to be an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, however high it goes. All right, we're not going to give the equation for radius. It's not terribly important, but the equation for the energy we will give, and it has n right in there as one of the, as one of the parameters, and that's called the quantum number. The ground state of an atom is the situation when n equals 1, and that's going to be the lowest energy orbit for the electron. Now, ground state can also be applied to molecules, things more complex than atoms. It always means the lowest energy state. In this case, for the Bohr model, n equals 1. So now that you know what a ground state is, you can answer the following question. So which is lower in energy, a hamburger or a steak? A hamburger, because it's in a ground state. OK, so, so now we know that important uh, piece of information, what a ground state is. and. Um, so we can, some of you are just getting it, that's okay, it's late in the class. Um, all right, so now we can talk about the two processes then that are associated with the electron changing energy in the Bohr model. Again, the, the electron, if it's in the same circular orbit, it's gonna stay at the same energy, but it can sometimes move further away from the nucleus, in which case its energy increases. Or if it's further away from the nucleus, it can drop back down closer, in which case it's decreasing. So absorption is the situation when the electron interacts with a photon, so you, you basically shine a photon on the atom. And that causes the electron to move to higher energy, or to be farther away from the nucleus if we're thinking about the orbits of the electron. And so this happens when the energy of the photon 
is equal to the change in energy for the electron. And both of these would be positive values in that case. So again, when you absorb a photon, you absorb the energy from the photon, the delta E is positive, meaning that the electron is going to higher energy. And you can think about it as the photon is consumed in this process. So the energy of the photon goes into the atom, pushes up the electron to a higher level, and you consume the photon. The photon is no longer there after that process occurs. Now, again, in order for this to happen, the energy of the photon has to be equal to the change in energy of the electron. And so because the electron energies are quantized at very specific values, you can't just use any photon to do this. It has to be the right energy of the photon that corresponds to a difference in energy between two of those levels. If it's not the case, then the photon won't be absorbed and nothing will happen. And then emission is the opposite process. So if an electron is in a higher energy orbit above the ground state, it can move back down to a lower energy orbit. So you can't have emission from the ground state because it's already in the lowest energy state. But if it's in an excited state, which is a state that's higher than the ground state, the electron moves from a higher value of n to a lower value of n, higher energy to lower energy, and in doing so, it emits a photon. And that's what gives rise to those hydrogen lines that you observe when um, you know when you excite hydrogen and you observe the wavelengths of light that come off of it. That's emission. That's the electron moving from higher to lower energy. And in this case, the energy of the photon is the same magnitude as the change in energy for the electron once again. But the change in energy for the electron is negative because it's going from higher energy to lower energy. And so really, if you want to make it equal, you should say that's the absolute value. Because the photon energy is always positive. You can't have a negative photon energy. And so in this case, the change in energy for the electron in the atom is negative, less than zero. Okay. So when, you're, when you have a mission, it's going from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. The electron energy is decreasing, meaning that delta E is negative. All right, so that's how it all works in concept. Um, we have a little bit of time left, so let's go on to this next part here, which is a picture representation of the Bohr model. Not drawn to scale. Um, I'm drawing all the orbits as equally spaced. In reality, they're not, but again, we don't need to concern ourselves too much with the, the size of the orbits. But basically what you have is right there, that's the nucleus. So we talked about the nucleus being this small, dense region at the middle. So the Bohr model keeps that. We're not changing anything about the nucleus at this point. So for the whole rest of this course and the whole rest of your lives, you can know that the, the nucleus is small, dense at the center, has protons and neutrons in it. That's about all you need to know about the nucleus. What the Bohr model deals with, again, is the arrangement of the electrons around the nucleus, and they are arranged into these regular circular orbits. And so you have the closer to the nucleus, that's the ground state, n equals 1. And as you get further and further away, each of those circular orbits is associated with a higher quantum number n. So 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so on. As you get further and further away with the nucleus, the values of n get larger and larger. And then we can also look at how the energy levels are arranged. And so if we have lower energy at the bottom, higher energy at the top in a vertical scale, Again, the lowest energy state is n equals 1. That's your ground state. And then as you go to higher n values, the energy levels get higher and higher as well. But as I'm, what I'm showing here in the correct scale is that they get closer and closer together as you go up. So the gap between n equals 1 and n equals 2 is fairly large, but then the gap between n equals 2 and n equals 3 is smaller. And between n equals 3 and 4 is even smaller than that. And then 4 and 5 are really close together. So this is drawn to scale. And it shows that as you get to higher and higher values of n, each successive energy level, as you just jump one value of n, gets closer and closer together. That will come out from the mathematical equation that I'll give you either at the end of today or early next time um, about, about how these energy levels are calculated. And then finally, to talk about then the different hydrogen lines that we saw. So we saw that in the, in the hydrogen spectrum, going way back to when we introduced this, when you excite hydrogen, when you put electricity into hydrogen, it emits light, and it gives off these four wavelengths. 410 is like barely in the visible range, but these three here are all in the visible range. And so let's talk about then how those different colors of light are produced. And so what they figured out is that, um, and again, the mathematics of this will, will become more apparent here in a little bit, that if, um, if the electron starts at 
n equals 5 and goes down to n equals 2, that process there gives us the wavelength of 434 nanometers. So that 434 nanometer line that we observe in hydrogen is when an electron that starts at n equals 5 relaxes down to n equals 2 and it emits that 434 nanometer photon as the energy difference between those two. Um, and then if we look at the other possibilities, um, if we start at n equals 4 and go down to n equals 2, That corresponds to the 486 nanometer photon. I should have done these better color coded. Um, that should be a green photon, but I guess you'll, hopefully you'll forgive me for that. And then the last one would be if it goes from n equals 3 to n equals 2. That gives you the photon that's at 656 nanometers, the lowest energy one that's in the visible range for the hydrogen spectrum. So those are the three visible lines that are produced by hydrogen, um, and they correspond to different transitions of the electron from a higher energy value going down to n equals 2. Now you might be asking, well, why can't it go to n equals 1? Well, it can, but in that case, the energy gap is too large, and the photon produced is in the ultraviolet region, so you can't see it with your eyes. So it can, it can do that, and you would observe ultraviolet photons as a result of that, but they wouldn't be ones that you would see if you just put it through a prism because they're outside of the visible range. Okay, So again, the different colors of light, the different wavelengths that are produced are determined by the electron moving from higher energy to lower energy in, in different gaps as we go along. So the last thing we'll close with, and then we'll start, and we'll do a bunch of practice problems with this next time, are the energy levels, the, the equation for the energy levels. Actually, why don't we just stop here because I don't want to um, introduce this and I have to come back to it next time. So we'll stop there for now, um, and then next time when we come back, we will introduce this equation and then see some example problems of how to use it. Um, so we'll, again, we're going to cover, looks like, a few slides are going to be covered next time, but we should have time for that, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue on with what we started with today.